none of that now. I don't know what it is about Callum, but we'll sit back there in, in the fellowship hall, and I'm talking to him, and he says nothing. We come in here, and boom, all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows we're talking about him. <clears throat> okay, so uh, a couple of items we should discuss before we really get in, in, into the sermon tonight, and that is um, next Wednesday night, Brother Virgil is going to be in here. So Brother Virgil will be leading the service. Uh, Jill and I are going to be out of town on Wednesday night, so uh, we won't be here. Uh, <clears throat> We have uh, already posted on the church Facebook page the, the Chili Fellowship and the classic cars and the live music. Um, we don't have set live music yet, so Rocky, if you're working up something, can you get with Miss Krista and let her know what it is? And Brandon, if you're working up something, can you get with Miss Krista and let her know what it is? So if somebody asks me what type of live music, I'll have an answer. Because somebody already asked, and I said, I don't know. Uh, re really and truly, um, we have flyers. Miss Brenda's made us a nice flyer. We've posted it on several of the community pages and on the Facebook page, and some of you have already shared it. I would really like for you guys to invite somebody and then come, okay? Just come and have a bowl of chili, and then, uh, you know, I'm not asking you to tackle somebody or anything like that. Just invite somebody to come to fellowship and then introduce them to a few people so they can see that we're almost normal, all right? Almost. <laughs> Everybody has their own marginal bit of crazy. Uh, and, and I think we're comfortably in that margin. So, no, no. So if we can just get that flyer printed out, just one of those color flyers, we can make copies at the copy machine. And then I, I'd like for everybody, I like for every member of the congregation to take at least one flyer and give it to somebody and invite them to come. Now, if you're if you're at work or something, of course, we're not asking you to, to skip work or anything like that. But we are asking you to talk positively about something that's happening inside the house of God. That's all. Uh, absolutely. And have live music, whatever that is. Uh, it won't be me. Okay. Uh, okay. That'd be great. All right, so... John chapter 1, verse 39. Remember last week we were talking about the, uh, John the Baptist had spoken to his, his disciples and had said, there's Jesus and, and he is the lamb. And then uh, they actually were following Jesus and Jesus turned around and said, hey, what are you guys doing? And he said, well, we want to see where you live. And his response in John chapter 1, verse 39 was, he said to them, come and see. They came and they saw where he was staying and, he remained, and they remained with him that day. Now here's the thing. I, in some... In some passages it says, and this was about the 10th hour. So the 10th hour is the 10th hour from dawn. If you figure dawn is about 6 o'clock, then you're looking at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So the Jewish calendar, the Jewish clock works like that. So the, the number of hours in the day starts from daylight. So from whatever hour dawn is, then if it's the ninth hour or if it's the 4th hour, then it's from, say, 6 a.m. That's basically how I've always figured it, somewhere around 6 o'clock in the morning. Because in most places in the world, sun comes up somewhere at, around that time. If you happen to be living on the equator, I don't know what happens to you. I don't know. I've not been that blessed. So when it says that, that they, they came and they saw where he was staying, and then it continues in, in this section, so I had to put it on the slide. Now this was about the 10th hour. So this is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So what you actually see here is they came to his house, or they came to where he was staying, and they were so intrigued by where it was that he was staying, or maybe not intrigued, but maybe not put off, because you have to understand, our human connotation to this actually does start to play in. When we ask someone something almost, let's just say, two-thirds of the time, there's a negative connotation to it. Like, we want to know, hey, what about this? And we're expecting them to say something we don't like. So when they ask Jesus, we want to see where it is you live then, or where you're staying, then there was that negative connotation to it. Perhaps, or maybe it's just an inquisitive connotation, well, hey, what are you really about? Are you really about like money and having this nice house? Are you really about helping people? So you're going to stay someplace where there's a lot of people coming and going? So they wanted to see where it was he was staying. And when they get there, it says that they stayed. So when they get there, they saw something that they liked. They didn't see something that put them off. They didn't see something that, that turned them off on Jesus. They didn't see something that gave them a negative connotation, so they stayed. Have you ever been to somebody's house where you didn't want to stay? 
Okay. So we all know what happens. Okay. Okay. So in this particular instance, they said they wanted to see where Jesus was staying. He said, come and see. They came. Not only did they see, but they stayed. You three. For Facebook, that's Lovey Terry, Susan Burns, and Jill Crocker. Miss Martha, can you can you get control of that group? It really has. It really has. John chapter one, verse thirty-nine. They went to see where Jesus was staying. He stayed. They stayed. Verse forty. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So now we actually start to find out who these people are who were following Jesus, and we get a little bit more detail. So one of the two that heard John speak to say that, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. One of those two was <coughs> Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41. He first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Now this is where woo, I start to get excited, because I want you to think about this for just a second here. They said, or they were, they were following John the Baptist. John the Baptist introduced them to Jesus. They started following Jesus. Jesus says, What are you doing? He said, We want to see where you stay. He said, well, come on, and I'll show you. And they followed him, and they got there, and when they got there, they stayed. And one of those two people was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And the very next thing that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, did after he found the Messiah was he went to find his brother and say, hey, we found this guy. Now, you've got to think about this for just a second, because if you go back to the Old Testament, it's the foretelling of the Messiah is thousands of years that the Jewish people have been looking for the Messiah. And, and if you remember all of the stories we read through Matthew and through Luke, talking about Jesus coming and, and the angels making the announcement, so everyone knew that the Messiah was there, or at least they should have because the announcements were made. Now we see Jesus as an adult. People are still looking for him. How do I know? Because when, <clears throat> when Andrew found the Messiah, he went to go find his brother and say, Aha, we got him. Now I love that because you know what that means? People cared. Really and truly, this is, this is the Jewish population actually cared that the Messiah actually came. It wasn't just, you know, oh, let's just go do that Jewish thing because that's what we've always done. No, they were actually looking for the Messiah. And the great thing about this is when they found the Messiah, now this is the hard part, this is where I'll start to preach, I'll start looking for your toes here in just a second. When they found the Messiah, they didn't keep it a secret. He went to someone who he knew, someone who he loved, someone who desperately needed the Messiah, and it was his brother. I love that because where do you start with? The people in your sphere of influence. And what do you tell them? I found the Messiah. Now this is a great section of scripture for preachers because whoo, if I could just get everybody that finds Jesus to tell somebody else that they found Jesus, my job gets a lot easier. If I could continue to convince you after you have found Jesus that you should tell somebody you found Jesus, my job gets incredibly easier. I'm not expected then to go and tell 2,000 people in Linden and 5,000 people in Atlanta that I know who the Messiah is. I actually have some help. And all I'm asking you to do is what Andrew did. He just went to his sphere of influence. He didn't go to some stranger's group. He didn't stop somebody on the street. I'm not asking you to stand at the intersection with a sign saying, I found the Messiah. No, I'm asking you to tell the people who are in your sphere of influence that you know Jesus. That's what Andrew did. Very clearly here, we're talking about the Messiah. They went in and put it in parentheses, or in brackets for us, translated, which is the Christ. For thousands of years, they've been waiting for the Messiah. Andrew shows up, and he tells his brother Simon Peter, I found him. Now, I have an older brother, and I have a younger brother, and I'm going to be honest with you. If I found something that I knew they were both looking for, I would go home and say, Aha! I found it first! You were looking. You're older than me, and you couldn't do it. You're younger than me and have healthier legs, and you couldn't do it, but I did it. So now I want to, I want to, I want to, mm. that's just the truth of the matter. I'm just telling you how it is, and I believe that some of you are exactly that same way, George. 
if your sister Anna was looking for something and you found it, would you be like, aha, I found it? <laughs> He's still not that excited. Okay, Anna, just tell the truth. If your brother had been looking for something for 10 years and you found it, what would you say? <laughs> Mom's in on this one. She's like, yes, definitely. Okay, I want you to think about that because in all actuality, I'm not asking you to remove the humanity from this particular message. I'm asking you to include the humanity. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, found the Messiah because he was following not the Messiah, but John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, there's the one. Andrew was smart enough to say, okay, if that's the one, then that's the one I'm going with. And then that's the one who asked him, what are you doing? He said, I want to see where you live. He said, well, come on, and I'm going to show you. And then when he got there, he stayed, and then the next day, or soon thereafter that, he goes to find his brother to tell his brother, I found something you guys have been looking for forever. Forever, I found the Messiah. <clears throat> Point number one. I think I got that nailed down, right? Find Jesus and then tell somebody. <laughs> we'll go back and do it again. Hold on. This one's just for Miss Brenda. When you find Jesus, tell somebody. Don't find him and keep it a secret. Because the thing that Jesus does for you in your life that brings that calm and that peace and that reassurance that you're not alone in this world, that's exactly what the people in your sphere of influence need to hear. Because God has revealed himself to you so you can in turn reveal him to somebody else. There's no secret, Jesus. There's a Messiah. He was predicted for thousands of years. It's been thousands of years now. So hey, we've pretty much got him identified. Like, this is nailed down. Jesus is the Messiah. Some people don't agree with me. Some people are wrong. <laughs> Some people would say the same thing to me, and that's okay. But when, when I had Jesus revealed to me, I did walk the aisle, and I did make that confession, and I did follow through with believer's baptism, and then I was excited to be alive and no longer dead in my sins and trespasses. So I wanted to tell people. Verse 42. Then he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. <clears throat> that whole translation plays into the the first pope of the Catholic Church and the stone on the... It, it gets a little muddled. But in this particular instance, he brought him to Jesus. Now, I want you to think about that. He was out looking for Jesus. He found Jesus. He came to get his brother. And when he got his brother, he didn't just tell him, hey, I found Jesus. He said, come on, I'm going to go introduce you. I found the Messiah. I want to introduce you, my brother, to the Messiah. And in this particular instance, we can see Simon was like, okay, I'll go meet this guy. And when he gets there, Jesus starts working on his heart right away. He says, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated as stone. I think we get to point two. Oh, verse 43, and then point two. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Oh, yeah, I know I waited to verse 43 now. Point two. I'm going to be honest here. Jesus wanted to go someplace. He went. He introduced himself to somebody, and he said, hey, come follow me. If Jesus can do that, the Messiah, the perfect one, if he can introduce himself to a stranger and say, hey, come follow me, and he is our example, shouldn't we be able to do exactly the same thing? Shouldn't we be able to introduce somebody to Jesus and say, hey, you really should follow Jesus? I mean, it's, it's, this is one of those things that people are like, well, Brother Claude, I don't really know how to talk to people. Remember, he was talking about to his brother. He wasn't talking about to a stranger. You talk to your brother all the time. Even when you don't like them, you talk to them. You call them all kinds of names, right, lovey? <laughs> She'll repent next week. <laughs> Too much reality. 
But if Jesus could introduce himself and say, hey, come follow me, and he's our example, we should be able to introduce people to Jesus and say, hey, I think you should follow him. Hey, there, there's this guy I want to introduce you to, the Lord. And he loves you so much that he died for you. And, and, and he paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future. The stuff you didn't even know you were going to do tomorrow, he's already paid for. And he did that so he can have a relationship with you. So I really think that you should have that relationship with him because that's the proper thing to do for somebody who's willing to die for you. I'm not asking you to get theological. I'm not asking you to get, you know, I don't want you to talk somebody into it. I don't want you to beat somebody over the head. But I do want you to see that this is the example that our Lord and Savior left for us. He said, hey, my name is Jesus. Come follow me. You don't have to be real smart to say that, ladies and gentlemen. You, you do not have to have a college degree. You do not. You don't have to have a high school diploma to find something and see that it's valuable and then share that with people you care about. Verse 44. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Now we know Andrew was following John the Baptist. And Andrew heard John the Baptist say that Jesus is the Messiah. So then he started following the Messiah. And the Messiah said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to see where you stay. And he said, okay, come on, I'll show you. And then he got there, and then he stayed. And then he went to go find his brother, Simon Peter. And he said, Simon Peter, I found the Messiah. They also know Philip. It's a small town, like Linden. <clears throat> now Philip was from Bethsaida, a city, the city of Andrew and Peter. Verse 45. Philip found Nathanael. We don't, even see, we don't even see Philip's conversion here. We don't see Philip being brought to Jesus. We just know that it happened. How do we know it happened? Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So in this particular instance, we don't see Philip's transition. We don't see his conversion, but we know that he actually is owning up to it because he says that we have found. He didn't find anybody, remember? It was... It was Andrew. And then Andrew told Simon Peter. And then they, they found Philip because they knew Philip. And then Philip joins in. He says, hey, we found that guy that Moses has been talking about. You know, the one written in the Old Testament? You know, the Messiah, the one that was going to come and be the Savior? Now, I'm not sure he understood the content of the character of Jesus the way we do looking back upon history. I don't know at this point that they weren't looking forward to Jesus being the great military leader to free them from the Roman Empire. I don't know what their level of expectation was, but I know what their belief was. How do I know? Because they tell us, we found the Messiah. We. We don't know what Philip did here at all. As far as I know, they bumped into Philip at Taco Bell. Probably not Taco Bell, okay. <clears throat> is, there, is there a Jewish Taco Bell, Daniel? Do you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> the thought of that was funny. <clears throat> Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Very clearly they're identifying here our Messiah to the person, to the son of Joseph, to the person they're saying that Jesus Christ, our Messiah, is the one that Moses and all the prophets wrote about. Verse 46. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Hey, come see. Do you start to see here that we've got a pattern going now? Remember, it was not Nathanael, but Andrew. What did he do? He was following Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Come see. And now we get down. So he told Simon Peter, who told Philip, who is now telling Nathanael. And Nathanael says, can anything good come from Nazareth? And I love this. Philip's response was just as basic as Jesus' response. Come see. I love that. What do you have to do? Tell them, come see. What are they going to come see? They're going to come see that when we come into corporate worship, that we sing songs to the glory of God. We bow in corporate prayer together. We encourage each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we leave this place feeling better than it was when we got here. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> what do you have to do? Tell somebody you found Jesus and invite them to come see. Luckily for all of you, we're hosting an event on the 28th of January. <laughs> Well, we're going to feed them free chili. We're going to let them look at some nice cars. And we're going to play some live music. What do we want them to come see? We just want them to come see that this 
is God's house. And that we have the ability to get along at different ages, from different cultural backgrounds. We have the ability to come in in corporate worship and enjoy it. I'm planning on having a good time when I come to church. Every time. Sometimes you guys warn me before I get here that I probably shouldn't have that plan. But it doesn't matter. I've already planned. Every time I come to church, I'm going to have a good time. How can you not come and intermingle in worship with the Father, the Creator, who spoke and the world leapt into existence, and not go, Woo, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. See, I mean, it, it should be something we look forward to. It should not be something like, oh, it's Sunday. I have to go back and listen to that guy again. What are you going to say? Hey, come see. What are they going to do? I don't know. Why don't you come see? Is it going to be any good? I don't know. Why don't you come see? <clears throat> I've heard all the excuses before, but it's just pretty basic, ladies and gentlemen, that, that God is teaching us how they began what we call Christianity with just that simple process. Find the Messiah. Tell somebody. They don't believe you? Tell them to come see. Find somebody. <laughs> tell them you found the Messiah. If they don't believe you, tell them to come see. <clears throat> I love patterns in Scripture. And, and I, I love that we, as humans, love patterns in our daily lives. And when you can acknowledge that Jesus is teaching us in a pattern, it, it just reassures me that not everything is broken in the world today. Because this is a pattern that still works. Verse 48, 47, I'm sorry. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit! Exclamation point. So Jesus wasn't whispering about Nathanael before he showed up. He's calling out to him. He's like, there's a guy right there, and there's no deceit in that guy. Where's Leland? Oh, right over there. How do I know? Leland will tell you what he's thinking, whether you want to hear it or not, right? Sitting behind the glass, I want to introduce everybody to Rocky. Rocky will tell you what he's thinking, whether you want to hear it or not. So in this particular instance, Jesus is identifying the character of Nathaniel before Nathaniel even shows up. He's like, there's a guy right there. When he gets up here, I know there's no deceit in that guy. He's going to tell you exactly what's on his mind. What was on his mind a little bit earlier? Can anything good come from Nazareth? He's questioning whether or not Jesus is actually the Messiah. He hadn't even met him yet. He's walking towards Jesus, and Jesus said, that guy right there, I like that guy. He's going to be honest. He's going to tell you exactly what it is he's thinking. Verse 48. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, in this particular portion of Scripture, it doesn't say that Philip was walking with Nathanael. So I don't know if they were coming up together or not. I don't know. If Nathanael's walking up by himself... And he hears Jesus talking about him, and he says, hey, how do you know me? And then he says, well, when Philip, well, before Philip even got to you, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Then now Nathaniel has a reason to understand that Jesus Christ is standing in front of him because he's talking about somebody else who's not there that he just had an interaction with at a location where he also was not there, but he clearly knows. I love that about Scripture because what does that tell us about Jesus? He knows your past, he knows your present, and he knows your character. You know, the great thing about that is if you understand that God knows your past, he knows your present, and he knows the content of your character, you have no reason to put on any airs. You just are what you are. Nathaniel, he was just that guy. Hey, this is all I am. Take it or leave it. Verse 49. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God, exclamation point. You are the king of Israel, exclamation point. Now, depending on how you read this particular story, you may think, well, he didn't really do too much to impress Nathaniel, did he? He identified his past, he identified his present, and he identified his character. Anybody that does that in the modern world, you're impressed by. You are. 
when someone walks up and they tell you right away, okay, I can see that you've, you're upset about something, and I just want you to know whatever you're upset about shouldn't really interact with, with our, our conversation. Like, how do they know I was upset? And why are they trying to calm me down? And you ask, how'd you know I was upset? Well, your, your brow was furrowed, and you just looked like something was on your heart or something was on your mind, and your shoulders were shrugged over a little bit, and you looked like maybe the weight of the world was just wearing you down. And you're like, oh, this guy cares enough to notice. God cares enough to know. There's a difference. Nathaniel responded to Jesus' interaction with him by acknowledging he was who he was told he was. He didn't walk up and say, that's a great parlor trick now, Jesus. Can you, make, can you walk on water? He didn't say that. He had been told that they had found the Messiah. How do I know? That's what they were telling everybody else. And then he had questions about whether or not it was real. And they said, why don't you come see? How do I know? That's what they told everybody else. And then he showed up. And he believed. He believed. How do I know? Because that's what he says. You are the son of God, exclamation point. You are the king of Israel. I gotta be honest. I wish my first interaction with Jesus would have been that way, but it wasn't. I was much more stubborn than Nathaniel. I was much more hard-headed. I took much longer to convince. But in the end, I came to the understanding that God does know my past. He does know my present, and he does know my character. Verse 50. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. I love this as a first interaction with Jesus. You believe already? Woo! Wait till you see what I have in store for you. Woo! You understand already that I am the actual Messiah? You are going to enjoy the next thing. Woo! I can't wait till tomorrow. Your face is going to be just this bright. <laughs> because I said I saw you under the fig tree you believe you were going to see greater things than these this is almost point three but I had to wait to verse 51 and he said to him most assuredly I say to you hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angel of God descending and ascending upon the son of man because I saw you under the fig tree you believe, man, wait until you see what I have in store for you. You are going to see the heavens open and angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He's claiming Messiahship in that statement, Son of Man. And he's saying, if you think that this is impressive, wait until you see what's coming next. And then they embark on a three-year journey, and he sees leopards healed of leprosy. He sees the lame walk. He sees the blind have their sight restored. He sees the multitudes fed with fish and bread. He sees Jesus walk on water and calm the storm. Point number three. Look for the miracles. And I want to emphasize that for just a second. Because I don't think we do. I don't. I think that the, the modern news cycle and the modern climate in our culture is not to look for miracles, but to look for misery. Man, if something bad happens, they report on it. If something bad happens consistently, they'll report on it consistently. If something bad happens anywhere in the world, we are going to find out about it. Why? Because we're not looking for the miracles of God anymore. We're looking at, at the misery of this world. And I think that this has to be one of those ploys of the devil to get us distracted so we're no longer looking for the miracles. So that we're so overwhelmed with the grief and the negativity in the world, we no longer have the ability to be that shining light on the hilltop. We don't have the ability to stand here and say, it is good to be a child of God. I know that the world is cold and hard and not everybody is going to be nice to me, but I also know that I have a home in heaven forever and ever and ever and nobody can take it away from me. 
Look for the miracles, ladies and gentlemen, because they're happening. Look, look for the miracles, ladies and gentlemen, because our God is still alive and he's still at work. Look for the miracles, ladies and gentlemen, so that when you see them, you can be encouraged to tell somebody in your sphere of influence, and if they say, I don't believe that, you can say, come see. Look for those things that give us the ability to encourage the lost and the downtrodden because they need to be encouraged. And ladies and gentlemen, sometimes the lost and the downtrodden is sitting right here with you. Sometimes they just need to be encouraged to look for those miracles because they're still happening. How do I know? Scripture says, my father works, so I work. <clears throat> so let's go to work. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with an opportunity to come into your house. Thank you, dear Lord, for the fellowship meal we had, for the van that is run, for the children and for the youth that are here tonight, for our ability, dear God, to raise our voices in song, and for our ability, dear God, to enjoy being in the presence of you. Amen. Thank you.